Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Ricci. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Oh, let's start this journey uh, in the wonderland of, of Team Film Group. Uh, this topic is actually very, very vast, so there is no way I can cover uh, all the relevant concepts and all the techniques in a single talk. So we will start from some general concept, and then we will just narrow down to specific techniques for growth and characterization of team films. Uh, and then I will leave you some useful re references if you want to go deeper into the topic, or you can talk to me later. Okay, so let's start from the basics. What is a thin film? A film is a thin layer of material coating a support or a substrate. Uh, an example that everybody has in their house is a household mirror where there is a layer of metal that coats a glass plate. Or an example that most people have in their laboratory can be uh, one of those uh, aluminum protector, protected mirrors that we, that we can buy from Tor Labs, Newport, Edmund Optics. Um, in particular, we will see that this can be defined as thin film. When a film is thin, so the definition is uh, a thin film has a thickness that ranges from the order of 0.1 nanometer for films that are one atomic layer thick, which we call monolayers, or up to one micron thick. So for example, the mirrors that we have in our laboratory uh, have like a layer of 100 nanometers of aluminum, and then a protective layer of silicon dioxide, both of the order of uh, hundreds of nanometers. So this is a thin film, and actually it's two films, so it's a bilayer. An example of a monolayer film, for example, is a superconducting lead films that are just one monolayer thick on the, on the surface of silicon 111. So these are the two extremes. In between, there is everything. Okay, so how do we make a thin film? There are a lot of techniques, and here I kind of divided them based on the state of the precursors. Uh, for example, the mirror that we have in our house is maybe done by, via electroplating. The mirror that we have in the lab is made with the physical vapor deposition technique uh, called sputtering. Um, among, among the vapor deposition technique, we have two families, the chemical vapor deposition and the physical vapor deposition we will focus on today. Um, what, is a what is physical? vapor deposition. So uh, physical vapor deposition is a vacuum technique um, that uses physical means to turn a condensed phase that can be liquid or solid into a vapor. Then we have the transport of this vapor to the substrate where a condensation occurs and our film, you know, happens. <laughs> so, and the main techniques that are used today in uh, physical vapor deposition are, for example, sputtering, laser ablation, e-beam deposition, or thermal evaporation. The first two techniques use plasmas or uh, exist, uh, you know, they bring their um, condensed phase in a very excited state of matter. And uh, they typically use process gas gases, so actually they don't, rec they don't work in very high vacuum, but the base vacuum that uh, before adding these uh, process gases, must be anyway very quite good uh, um, of the order at least of 10 by minus 7 tor. Um, while uh, techniques like in evaporation or thermal evaporation, where the vapor expands freely in the vacuum, require that uh, pressure lower than 10 by minus 7 tor. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so I don't really need to go into the vacuum part because Rachel and Steve, Steven already have talked about that. Um, one thing I want to point out anyway is um, the ratio between the residual air molecules in the vacuum chamber uh, to um, the evaporation, evaporated molecule that we want to use to grow a film. For example, at a deposition rate of 0.1 nanometer per second. That is very high for me anyway. It's like two order of magnitudes higher. That's what I would like. And uh, as we can see, there are way more air molecules that would 
heat our substrate, then evaporating, evaporate material molecules, unless we go below 10, 10 to minus 7 torr. So it's really a necessity for physical vapor deposition technique to, to operate in high to ultra high vacuum. Okay, so molecular beam epitaxy is a physical vapor deposition technique that originates from, it's like the most sophisticated type of thermal evaporation. So the typical sources use thermal evaporation of elements, even though more complex machine exists that use reactive gases, gases e-beams, um, hybrid sources. And it's definitely a ultra high vacuum technique. It operates below 10 by minus eight torr. And it's very powerful because you can have a very precise control of the growth rates via, the con via controlling the material fluxes that can be controlled very, very precisely. And also being a new HV technique, um, we can integrate in these machines a lot of diagnostic tools that can be operated in real time during the growth. <coughs> so as a result, the films that we can produce via molecular beam epitaxy um, are uh, usually very ordered and clean uh, surfaces that make them suitable for, for example, surface science analysis via ARPES. And in some cases, for example, in the case of uh, silicon films deposited on silicon, the quality of the epi layer can be even higher than the substrate itself. And this really promoted the development of semiconductor technologies in the last decades. Okay. So let's see how do we make this molecular beam. I told you it's an evaporation technique. So let's consider the physics of evaporation. So if we have a closed container with a condensed phase in equilibrium with a vapor phase, the flux of vapor molecules that hit the surface of the condensate and, uh, con and, and go back to the liquid phase is given by this expression that we can obtain for, from the <coughs> uh, kinetic theory of gases. And in equilibrium, of course, nothing changes. So the number of the condensation flux, so the density of molecules per unit area per second that leaves the surface it's equal to the one that goes back to the condensed phase. Of course, this doesn't work if you want to make a film out of it. So we need to open the container and have a net flux uh, in which uh, the evaporation flux is higher than the condensation flux. And in this case, things go out of equilibrium and became more and more, a little more complicated and the efficiency of an evaporation source uh, it can be even two order of magnitudes lower than the limit that is given by the equilibrium uh, evaporation flux. To make things more efficient and more easily controlled with less parameters, um, MV sources are based on the Knudsen cell design. In a Knudsen cell, we have our uh, material that is kept at a very stable temperature inside an enclosure that is very well thermally uh, isolated so that inside this enclosure, um, the uh, liquid or solid is in equilibrium with, it, with its vapor. Then there is a little opening on top of the source from which the molecules can escape. And the expression for the net flux that escapes, um, that escapes the source is basically uh, similar to the, to the equilibrium evaporation flux minus the external pressure. We are in UHV, so the external pressure, if we want to use this vapor to grow a film, is many order of magnitude lower than the equilibrium vapor pressure of the material at the set temperature that we are using. So we can definitely use temperature to control very precisely the evaporation flux. The strongest dependence of uh, the flux is through the equilibrium vapor pressure, which we can find in many tables. Uh, that typically it has an exponential dependence of temperature, which is very strong, 
and uh, can, be, can be calculated using uh, A and B parameters that are reported in tables. So we can definitely you know what kind of flux we can expect from, from, a, from a nonsense cell. Okay, so why then this is a molecular beam? The, 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 the emitted molecular beam, as we have seen, at this vapor pressure, at these pressures in which we are, in which we, the molecules um, proceed through uh, unperturbed straight trajectories. This means that the flux is highly directional. The number of uh, uh, atoms that we can deposit on a wafer per unit area, uh, it's related to the number of evaporated molecules by this relationship where R is the distance between the source and the wafer. And then we have two angular parameters that are related to the orientation of the source and the orientation of the wafer. Um, <clears throat> for this reason, for example, in a real ME system, the effusive source that are not exactly nonsense cells, but similar to them, uh, are uh, you know, disposed radially, so they, they are at the same distance from the substrate wafer we want to deposit. They all point to, to where it, towards it, and they um, have the same incident, this incident angle. In our ME system at Cornell, it's 25 degrees. Um, having a small distance is good because we are more efficient in growing, but definitely we lose some uniformity because these angles tend to be large. So our system is designed to deposit roughly uniform films only on a, on a diameter of one inch. Okay, another interesting thing about molecular beams is that since in this regime, the molecules have thermal energy, the energy of the source, um, the temperature of the source basically, uh, we can always convert the flux into an equivalent pressure that we can then use you know, to make you know, thermodynamical consideration on the growth nucleation of the field. Okay. So now we have made this molecular beam vapors. Uh, how will the growth of a thin film proceed? So there are some important stages in the, in the film deposition. The first one is called nucleation. Then we have nucleus growth in which the nuclei that form on the surface grow, then they start to uh, merge with each other, and finally an, an, an embryo of the film is grown, is, is, is realized, and the film will start growing on top of it. And these stages are very important because especially the nucleation stage is the one that will determine the morphology how our, how our, our film will look like. Um, so the nucleation, by definition, is the initial step of formation of a new thermodynamic phase, which in this case is a solid phase nucleating from the vapor phase on our substrate. How this happens? Well, we have an incident flux of molecules that will then, that can, a fraction of them will absorb, will be absorbed on the, on the, on the substrate, and then they will generally move around and uh, maybe meet another particle and, be, and, and then uh, for, form like a bind uh, little you know, cluster. And at some point, um, at some point, you know, if nothing happens, they will re-evaporate. But as the, as the particles um, meet together, they became more and become more and more stable on the substrate until they form something that is called a stable nucleus. That is the first part, the first, you know, the birthing event of our film. So for example, if we look at the initial stages of growth of a thin film, what we will see is like some collection of little island, little patches, uh, which have roughly the same size and some characteristic shape. So <clears throat> do they all look like this? No, actually there are different growth, growth modes. 
Um, I think I can start this video. The first grow mode is the one that I showed before. So we have some, some you know, little islands, 3D islands, that then will grow and merge together and make a continuous field. The second type of thin field growth that we can observe, that has been observed, is the Frank van der Mer, where layer by layer growth, where instead we don't have little 3D islands with a characteristic shape, but we have monolayer thick 2D island that form on the film surface, and then they expand, they merge until uh, a continuous, you know, until the first layer is completed, and then the second layer will start to grow on top of it. For example, this is cobalt on ruthenium. And then, okay, it looks like there are two things, but another option is that after growing a few monolayers, something goes wrong, something changes in the surface tension in the energies, and on top of a few monolayers, some islands will start to grow. And this is a typical effect uh, due to uh, epitaxial strain that happens for many metal, many metal growths, metals on metal. Okay, so let's uh, go to, sorry, okay. So how do, how do, how do growth parameters such as uh, temperature and uh, vapor pressure or rate influence the growth of the nucleation, the nucleation phase of a field? Tendentially, you can imagine that if you have high temperature, which is equivalent to having a low rate, um, the, nucle the nuclei must be bigger to stay on the substrate. And this means that if we grow at high T, low rate, we have a better opportunity to create films that have large crystal grains, and, um, but they will take longer to grow. Instead, if the temperature is low, it's difficult to re-evaporate clusters so many small clusters will form, and we will have fine grains or amorphous film, but we will cover our substrate very fast, very rapidly. But so can I just decrease, decrease my rate until I, I think I will form a, one single crystal out of my film? I can't really, unless I want to wait for a very long time uh, for the life of the universe, because uh, especially when the film grows through islands, um, there is a critical vapor pressure that we have to keep uh, to make so that the nucleus formation rate uh, is large enough that our film will effectively start growing. So if, I, if my rate is too low, my temperature is too high, my film may not grow and <clears throat> this is even, even for the case of layer growth, actually, there is a pretty strong dependence. So we cannot really go all the way to the lowest possible rates. Okay. So what happens after the nucleation? At some point, the, num the nuclei that will stick on the substrate will, will uh, start, uh, will, will increase in number, but then at some point the number will, will uh, saturate, and the existing nuclei will start growing, taking all the available add atoms on the surface. Um, and then this, this nuclei will start merging together until uh, very large crystalline islands are formed. And this is basically the template on which our film will grow. Okay, let's go now to another topic. You know. Some of the films, special films, are epitaxial thin film. And we, have, we repeat this concept many times here in CBB for the photocathode group. What, what does it mean? What does epitaxy mean? We say that a film is epitaxial when its atoms arrange above the surface of the substrate in an ordered fashion. Um, this does, don't, does not necessarily mean that our film is a single crystal and only has a unique orientation on the substrate. Um, what it means is that there is a precise epitaxial relationship, so some rules with which the lattice parameter of the substrate will align with the lattice parameters of the film. 
Okay, an, an example is, for example, the oxidation of magnesium 001 single crystals when exposed to oxygen. So magnesium has an hexagonal structure. When we expose it to a high enough dose of oxygen, an oxide, MgO, which has a cubic structure, will, grow on, will start growing on top of the magnesium. So, if you look at it from above, the unit cell of magnesium actually has this 60 degree angle between the, between the lattice parameter. So, of course, the, lattice param the, the oxide cannot align all its lattice, in plain lattice parameters to the magnesium. As a consequence, MgO can grow in three uh, different equivalent uh, epitaxial domains on magnesium, and the epitaxial relationship is the one that is expressed by this, by this, by, you know, by this expression here. Okay, but in many cases, we grow like cubic things on cubic things, and there is only one epitaxial relationship that is realized. So, <clears throat> I was talking before about stress in the films, in the stransky krastanov growth. What is this stress? Why my film needs to be, may be stressed on the substrate? So, <clears throat> when atoms get absorbed on the substrate, they interact with surface potential that has a certain periodicity, the periodicity of the reciprocal lattice. And it may happen that substrate and film have different lattice parameter. So there is some misfit that is given by the difference between the bulk lattice parameter of the substrate and the lattice parameter of the film. If the F is greater than zero, my film will be under tension. Otherwise, it will be under compression. So what will happen? My film will, is going to be, you know, is going to be compressed or, or you know, tensile is strained on the, on the substrate. There is a, a, the earliest theory about strained epitaxial film, uh, the Frank van der Merwe theory, predicts that if F is less than 9%, then the film will try to adjust the lattice parameter to the substrate par par lattice parameter. And so what happened is that it can do this only up to a certain critical thickness, otherwise the energy that it accumulates is too large and something must break. So what happens? It will happen that above this critical thickness, uh, the film will start creating defects, like this interfacial misfit dislocation, that is a local distortion that allows the, all the rest of the film to live better and be less stressed. So here a lot of stress, but Overall, the rest of the film will be less stressed, so it's a gain. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so is, is this a bad thing? Why do we want strained films ever? No? Seems to be a very negative thing. But actually, strain is one, of, is one possible mean of tuning the material parameter. So one very important type of photocathodes that uh, we deal with here in the center of bright beams is spin polarized photocathodes. The most simple one is gallium arsenide activated with the cesium and oxygen. In this photocathode, if we excite electrons out uh, with a circularly polarized beam, more electrons with a certain spin orientation will be photoemitted than the opposite. Uh, this is because we could excite electrons from these total angular momentum states, and we have three times more electrons coming from this state than this other state that will give opposite polarized uh, spin orientations. But what if we wanted to have a fully polarized electron beam? Well, this can be achieved by straining gallium arsenide by 1%, for example, this creates a splitting between, between these two bands. So if we can only select with the appropriate photon energy the topmost band, then the fully, our electrons will be fully spin polarized. 
And you know, the, the only uh, drawback is the critical thickness of gallium arsenide is just 10 nanometers. So how can I make a thicker, thicker film because I want to have a good efficiency, a lot of electrons coming out with such critical thickness? My sample will relax. So the way we do that is by creating a super lattice where we alternate gallium arsenide with a, a thickness that is smaller than the critical thickness with another layer that will compress it again so the strain relaxation doesn't occur and we can grow to significant thicknesses without incurring in uh, relaxation. Okay. So, this is everything that can go wrong in thin films, right? We could, if we grow like silicon on silicon, I said it's better than the substrate, it's better than the single crystal. Gallium arsenide, on gallium arsenide, no problem. But because of all the strain problems, because the substrate may not be, may not be perfect, perfect, in general, in thin films, uh, in actual thin films, we can, get a all sorts of possible defects that may eventually dimin diminish the uh, properties, the mobility of, uh, of electrons in this, in this film. So how can we keep an eye on this while we are growing our film? So I will talk about only one real-time grow diagnostic that is reflection high energy electron diffraction, which is a very powerful technique because it gives you an immediate feedback, qualitative feedback on the modality of the film growth as you're growing. It's like having some special glasses that allow you to see, to see your crystal growing even though everything yeah, is small. Okay. So while well, I had a little bit of slides, but let's just go to see some images. Um, so read can be used definitely to look at the structure of thin films, to look at how many monolayers we are growing as, it is gr as we are growing, because the intensity of a read pattern is a critical function of the coverage of the final monolayer. So it allows you really to follow the growth one unit cell by one unit cell. And it's also termination sensitive. So for some classes of materials, for example, for example, you have strontium manganese oxide, we can definitely grow this material depositing one monolayer of one oxide on top of the other oxide. And as this happens, the, the, the read intensity will change and oscillate. And if our oscillations are constant in amplitude, they don't go up or down, this means that our composition is correct. Otherwise, you know, we'll have some residual or excess of the other that will decrease or increase the intensity of the read. And this uh, allows us to achieve 1% accuracy in composition. Okay, so of course, by glance, we can see that uh, we can figure out a lot of things that are happening on the surface of our sample just by looking at the read pattern, such as reconstructions of stoichiometries, roughening, polycrystalline defects, or even step edges on vicinal substrate. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so I will stop here, and uh, I would like to acknowledge Richie and John for inviting me to talk today. Maybe you won't acknowledge them. <laughs> um, and then all the people who gave me feedback, graphics uh, on, on, on this talk. Uh, and here there are the references in case you want to, you know, study more. And of course, yeah, <laughs> uh, I can answer your questions. Thank you. You know, because I am a very anxious person, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So, to do a capital growth, you need already a single crystal of your substrate, right? Where do you get that single crystal from? Oh, well, people know how to grow single crystal pretty well of uh, 
quite broad subset of materials. Like silicon, they grow like columns of silicon and then they cut them. And uh, so there is, a, you know, there is availability of many, uh, many type of single crystalline substrate we can use. Of course, not as many as the film that we can grow. That's why we have to adapt and you know, maybe choose the one that gives less strain. And another thing I did not mention, things can react. So maybe your, your substrate may mix with your film and things can, give, can go really horribly wrong. <laughs> What? Oh, yeah, yes, you can, as, as in the case of uh, gallium arsenide super lattices, you can definitely create artifi artificial crystal structure by alternating, you know, layer of uh, different materials. I don't know if I have, like this way, like you can do one, one block of one material, another block of another material, and then see how this fails out, you know, you can create new properties. Very often you do. Sometimes you can fix, you know, you can maybe change a temperature on your fuse source a little bit, and this will bring you back on business. If, if it doesn't go bad for too long, you can possibly fix it as long as you have enough thermal energy for things to self-heal themselves. <laughs> 